We are going to now kind of model a lesson. And what this lesson, how I would describe this lesson to you, is this is something that I would call close analytic reading. So some of you might have heard about this idea that there are some things that we need students um, to really dwell on, to read, reread, think carefully on in a very different way than we think probably typically happens uh, in schools um, across the country. And the question is like, so why are we doing this? First, let me say this isn't what every day looks like. This is just one of the things that we do in response to the Common Core. And this is the idea of, really, Sandra, did you say all kids need to read complex text? Like, they are going to cry. They are going to be, like, shaking in fear. Like, how do you do that without paralyzing kids? What we're going to do now is actually going to model that. So at your tables, you have um, packets that are labeled a close reading of Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. And so this is, um, when I showed you this morning the um, AchieveTheCore.org website and under Steal These Tools, we had all of these close examinations of text. This is one of the things that you'll find uh, on that uh, website. And so this is um, probably our first one that we developed. And uh, there are people who told us at Student Achievement Partners that we spent more time developing this module than some textbook publishers spent doing a whole textbook series. Um, and, and so we'll talk about, like, great, this is good. What relevance does this have to these modules, to the shifts, to everything else? So I hope to be able to um, address all of this um, with you today. So the first thing I want you to do is kind of turn to the second page where you actually see the text of the Gettysburg Address. And so I was walking here with a 11th grade AP English teacher who told me she does this with her AP students in 11th grade. And uh, I want you to just first kind of read it to yourself. I'll give you a few moments to do that. Many of you probably think you know this, but indulge me for a moment here and uh, spend a couple minutes reading it to yourself. And so now as the teacher uh, of this huge lecture hall here, uh, I'm going to read this speech uh, to you. So this is President Abraham Lincoln's uh, speech on the Gettysburg Address that was given in 1863. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men living and dead who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us that from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. That this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. So the first thing I would ask you, not as students, but as educators, is what makes this Gettysburg Address a good selection of a text? Any thoughts, any ideas? 
the length, it's short. I wouldn't do a close reading of an entire novel. It's three paragraphs, but if you look at the you know, header, I think it says, or maybe as you go, this is about a five day lesson, three to five days on three short paragraphs. Yeah, it, I, I would say this is a challenging text for most kids. It's, it's targeted for us to be about ninth, 10th grade. She said it's a challenging text, I'm sorry. It's a challenging text for students to read, but it also has some simple pieces in it as well. Um, we can just say politically, it's a founding document of our nation. It, it, it has some relevancy just to you know, the, the larger cause of education, if you will. Any other ideas about what makes this good? Primary source, it's a relatable theme to this day. It, it is good. Now, in the, the agenda, um, it talks about me delivering this as a history lesson. We're going to talk about that a little bit. I'm going to first kind of talk about this as actually something that might happen in a high school English class. Okay? So we're going to talk about this as a high school English class. It's a good selection. And the question becomes, you know, there are some teachers who say, wow, this is really complex. Really tough. There's some tough things, some complicated sentence structures, some real choices that, that Lincoln made in, in developing this speech that probably aren't readily um, observable by most kids. And so the question that you should ask yourselves as teachers is, how do kids get good at reading something like this? By reading it. So, so this is what we're going to kind of model today, is what are some of the ways that we can get students not just good at reading the Gettysburg Address, because why that has value, how does this then make them better at reading other complex texts? Because whatever you heard about the uh, assessments that are coming down the pike, you're not going to be able to introduce the text to the kids. You're not going to be able to give them a preview of what that text is or all the strategies along. They're going to be faced with a complex text, and they're going to need the skills on the assessments and after high school when you're no longer with them either uh, uh, to be able to tackle these. So first question that I would ask you now in the role of students and me in the role of teachers is if we take a look at that very first sentence and focus on that for a bit. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. This sentence tells us a lot. And as we are students of literature, how authors decide to start something is really important. It's really important to understanding the message that they're about to do. There's some real thought that goes into every right piece of writing about how do you start. So let's see what we can find out uh, Lincoln is trying to communicate. We can do our favorite questions of who, what, when, where, why, and how. When was this speech delivered? Do we know that from the text? Sure, do we have to be students of history to know that? No, we can get that right from the text. We know that that is 1863. But when, what is the period of time that Lincoln is referring to in this opening sentence? What is he talking about? When what? OK, now Declaration of Independence, I'm hearing a lot of that. Do we see that specifically listed here? So if you're kids, if you are students, the when here that he's talking about is when our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation. So it's the forming of this nation. We could talk about Declaration of Independence. There's actually some fun ways that you could do that. You see that in the uh, footnotes here. There are some words that we decided to give definitions to. Score is one of those. There is no way from the text that you can figure out. I shouldn't say that. There, are, there is a way that you can figure out what score means. If you know he's talking about the Declaration of Independence, you know what year that is. You know the speech was given in 1863, depending on the students in your classroom. Because this would either sink or swim. Could you figure out what score means? It's a math problem, right? 
Okay? But you don't have to. I mean, you don't have to to get the meaning of the text. So anyway, the when is when this country was founded. Where are we talking about? From this first, just looking at this first paragraph, where are we talking about? This continent, right? This continent. Keep in mind, just like it was mentioned about this text itself, there are some questions, just easy answers, that we can just have some students participate very easily, and then some questions that we might offer that are a bit more uh, complex. So where is on this continent? Who is referred to in this first paragraph? Our father. Who are we talking about? Now, this is not text dependent. Who are we talking about as our fathers? Have we ever heard this idea of our fathers? Yeah, sure, our founding fathers. This is something that might be familiar uh, to students. And how did they form this nation? Conceived in liberty. What does that mean? Do you think your high school students know what that means? Conceived in liberty? No, I don't. I don't. It, it's certainly worth conversation, and we'll get back to that in a moment. Conceived in liberty is how this nation was formed. The what is that it, it formed a new nation. And so there's a lot of information in this very first paragraph that you could spend uh, a lot of time on. Now, if I were going to look at this first paragraph, can you tell me some words that are worth spending time on in class when you look just at this first paragraph? We kind of gave hint to one of them already. What's that? Proposition is a great one. Dedicated is another one. And the third one that I think is a good word worth dwelling on here. Conceived. So we have conceived. Now, conceived means a couple of different things in this speech. And we'll talk about that. Here, it means to bring forth something new. You'll see that we don't choose to define conceived for kids in a footnote. Because we do think spending some time with the text, there is some idea that students could start inferring from the text, pulling that definition out by reading the text closely. New nation conceived in liberty. So if kids get as far as like it started, it began from conceived, that's, that's a question worth um, doing, the, the word worth spending time on. Next word, a proposition. What does proposition mean? Can we figure that out just from looking at this text dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal? What is a proposition? It's an idea, a claim, something that we're all, you know, we, we could really in our classroom say, what if we said this nation was dedicated to the proposition that all men are not created equal? What would that have looked like? So really getting a sense of proposition here, just using the text and spending some close time. And just to say, I'm gonna kind of rush through some of these things. This is a three to five day, and I wanna just kind of give you a flavor for what classroom conversations would look like, how you scaffold, how you make a complex text um, make sense to kids. And then what we would do with students after spending so much time on that first paragraph is just ask them then to rewrite the first paragraph in their own words. What does it mean? Now, just to back up, I had you read it silently first and then I read it out loud. I would do that in a high school class also. You don't want kids to just be reliant on hearing it out loud first, and kids are gonna be at all different levels of ability in being able to grasp this text. I wouldn't ask them to read it out loud to the class, but that they should have a chance to face the text individually first, and now they should have a chance to kind of talk about, before we get into real depth, what does the first paragraph mean? And so students are asked within this example um, to rewrite the first paragraph in their own words. And then we would move on to the second paragraph. And here we see some of the same words again. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. And so what do you think he means when he says so conceived, means conceived? In that way, which we already know is in liberty, and so dedicated to the proposition, right? So we can continue to reinforce that we're, we're giving a speech here and we know what this refers to. We're starting 
to give kids a chance to understand what it means to tackle a text, have these kind of conversations internally as we're helping them understand how to tackle a text. And so why do you think, this is student conversation, Lincoln decided to say, or any nation so conceived and so dedicated. He could have said, now we are engaged in a great civil war, um, testing whether that nation can long endure. What do you gain out of saying, or any nation so conceived or so dedicated? What is he doing in this speech? He's actually elevating the cause here. We're not just talking about this country. We're talking about the idea that a group of individuals formed a nation out of their own free choice in liberty, decided to form a nation dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. It could be that other people in other places decide to do this. And what we are now talking about is can this idea actually endure? Creating a nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition. So that's important, that has huge impact on this. And so a way that you can do this with your students is a, a great example that applies to this text and others is to play around with the words. What if we took out that phrase? What if we change that phrase? What impact does that have on uh, the message of the, the um, speech right there? And through conversation, that's pretty much how you could spend a whole 45, 55 minutes just on those two sentences. If you really got some good dialogue with students about these words, about what this means, and so on. Now, let me just take a little bit of a, a sidetrack here to tell you um, about this example, the Gettysburg Address example. I don't know how many of you follow like the blogs and, and all of this stuff about Common Core and, and people. There are people who have really um, fought pretty strongly against this example and other examples that are on uh, the website. And the reason for that is because they uh, have claimed that what we have done here is scripted instruction. And I've had people actually come up to me to say, wow, the Common Core, you're expecting all these great things of kids and you are really gonna tell us as teachers what questions to ask, how many days to teach this, what you know, texts we should use. And what I tell you is, I could have put out on the website and we could have all been watching a videotape. And I have no doubt that any of you would have thought that what I meant to convey is you see that teacher on the videotape? Dress like that teacher, talk like that teacher, use the same hand gestures as that teacher. You wouldn't have thought that if you saw a videotape example. This is a text example. Teachers have a lot of liberty to decide I'm gonna ask this question, I'm gonna do the four score thing, or I'm not gonna do the four score thing. I'm gonna let kids really dwell on the idea of proposition, or I'm not gonna have them dwell on the idea of proposition. So when you're looking at this exemplar or others that we have out there, this is conversation. This is the idea that what we want teachers to really do with these examples is understand what the common core could look like in class and make decisions about other things that they do having had this experience. I was sharing with some folks yesterday that um, I presented uh, a couple of months ago to some state teams and the people who asked me to present the Gettysburg les address lesson said, and I want you to scare them. Like really punch them in the stomach, like this is common core, get ready for it. Like, and I basically said, no, I will not do that. It is not my, theory of teaching that I leave people paralyzed. What I want people to get in understanding these exemplars is that this kind of close analytic reading is not typically what's happening now in classrooms. We are not doing this. If I was in an English class reading this address, I don't know what that lesson would be. I know there are people here who, who do teach this and, and might be going over this over and over again, but this is just giving an example of how do you bring more students into deep understanding of complex text. So when we go on to the next day and we think about this idea of text-dependent questions, first day uh, we basically said there were three big questions that we asked students to answer. One is, 
that students should be able to answer. What does Lincoln tell us about this new nation in the first uh, sentence, and we already answered that, conceived in liberty, dedicated to the proposition. What happened four score and seven years ago when we brought that up already, the Declaration of Independence? You could do that or not do that. And what is being tested by this war? And according to what we just discussed in that second sentence, what's being tested in this war is could a group of individuals come together, decide to form a nation dedicated to a proposition? Now we we'll continue to read the second paragraph, and the question that we're going after is, what are people here assembled to do? So when we read the rest of that paragraph, we are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. So in everyday vernacular, what are we doing here? Dedicating a cemetery, a graveyard. That's what we're doing. How do we know that that's what we're doing? What, where, where's there evidence in the text that says that that's what we're doing? A resting place. I would ask kids to have conversations, because there are kids who are just going to say, oh, yep, it's a funeral, it's a great, and there are other kids who are going to say, wait, wait, where, where did you get that? Where did you get that? So really having conversations out loud with kids to talk about that. You need to read each of these pieces to understand that that's what's in fact going on here. You know it's a graveyard, final resting place, that they're there. And they're assembled there uh, to dedicate it. Now, dedicate is an interesting thing when you're studying the Gettysburg Address. It is used six times in this very short thing. Very short passage, we use dedicate six times. Can you find those six times? You could circle those six times. First paragraph, second paragraph, third paragraph, we use dedicate. We often joke that a modern author would have said, can you get a thesaurus already? Like, really, dedicate six times? But actually, it's worth having conversation with kids that dedicate using six times, let's talk about it. We could probably spend a whole class period talking about dedicated. What word comes closely with dedicated, kind of pairing up with dedicated in the first paragraph? Conceived. So in the first paragraph, it's conceived and dedicated. How about in the second paragraph? What's the word? Instead of conceived and dedicated, it's Am I going? Am I? Right, so it's conceived and dedicated. I'm sorry. Then when we go to the second, the third paragraph, then we have dedicate and consecrate. And then the third, um, later on at the end, we go from conceived and dedicate, consecrate and dedicate, and then what's the final thing that we're doing? Dedicate and honor and devote. So we go from conceived, and he's talking about the past, when we formed this nation four score and seven years ago, present. We are dedicating and consecrating this graveyard right now. And then when we get to the third paragraph, and again, we're kind of speeding through, we would read that closely also, we are now devoting. That's now where Lincoln starts talking about what's going to happen in the future from here on. He starts talking about the unfinished work ahead of us. We can't dedicate this the people who have died have dedicated this graveyard to a degree that we could not do that. What we're now getting ready to do is devote ourselves to the idea of this nation being formed in this way. Now, um, that is just giving you a little sense. If you look through the module itself, you look through this exemplar yourself, I just want to show you a bit about uh, the structure that we have here. So on the third page here, and I can't even tell you like the, the detail of conversation after conversation that went into how we design this, how much information we give, and so on. But that being said, it might or might not work for you, and you, you can just decide to kind of take it or leave it. But we, t we take the unit, 
little module, if you will, and separate it into a couple of days. Talk about what the activities are on page three. And then when you get to page four, you see some suggested guiding questions for this and some commentary. Like our idea is that we really want this to be taught well. And so how could we kind of have conversations with the users of this document that really give guidance? Not a script, just guidance for how you might do this. You might have English language learners in your class. You might do something a little bit differently about the vocabulary within this if you are teaching it um, with those students. And again, we're still talking about pretty much within an English language arts class because we can get really interestingly deep on choice of words, sentence structures, without even knowing a thing about the Civil War. But as I've talked about it right now, this isn't a lesson in the Civil War. I'll, talk, I'll show you later in this module where we said, if this was a lesson in Civil War, and this was being taught in a history class, how would that look differently? And so going through all of this, page five, six, seven, if you can skip now to page, um, let's see, page 19 in the module. You'll see some samples of questions typically asked in response to the Gettysburg Address that are in fact not text dependent. So very commonly, students read Gettysburg Address and are asked, have you ever been to a funeral? Have you ever heard a eulogy? What was that like? And you tell me which teacher is gonna interrupt that conversation to say, let's get back to the text. You know, that is really engaging to kids, can be kind of emotional as well. I mean, I've been in some of those classes where teachers are doing that, and it's, wow, get back to, to the lesson. It's really hard. It's interesting. Sometimes teachers are really into that kind of thing. But it's not getting us back to the text. And so a lot of times people have asked me about this, you know, text to self questioning. Are we, are we banning that from classrooms? And I would say that the idea is that we want to get as much out of the text as we can. That's our goal. Get as much out of the text as we can. Sometimes that means asking text to self questions, but as soon as you ask kids, have you been, ever been to a funeral? The students are no longer equal in front of that text. They have different experiences that they're bringing to play, some traumatic, some not so traumatic, some have no experiences to contribute to that. But when we're asking questions about Lincoln's words, what Lincoln is meaning, what he is intending, we can get what's just in the text in order to have that conversation. Um, when we first were developing this last summer, actually, we gave a, a huge presentation and just gave people the text and asked each table to kind of write some text-dependent questions on their own and share those up. And so, you know, it was really interesting. Someone, you know, came up with in that meeting the idea of this was past, present, and future. And we hadn't seen that before, and it was really, you know, interesting that, that um, individual educators listening to this would have some contributions and then people would say things like, you know, was Lincoln for or against slavery? Like, really? You can't get that at all from this text, but sometimes you, you'd get into that conversation. So this is just uh, showing some examples there. On page 20, you see some additional questions. You know, we, we weren't sure in developing this lesson whether people would say three days is all I'm going to spend or I might spend six, seven days on Gettysburg Address. So there's some additional uh, texts. And interestingly, for the Gettysburg Address, there are actually other versions of the text that kids could look at online and compare. What decisions were made from one version of the text to another? What choices were made? What impact did those choices have in writing this text? And so that's another uh, interesting opportunity that students uh, could have there. And so you have some guidance over the next couple of pages in looking uh, at that, um, at some of those changes. And then if you go on to the end of this, starting on page 25, now you can have some questions that might better show up in a history or a social studies class. 
Lincoln never mentions the word union over the course of the speech. Instead, he repeatedly refers to the nation. Why do you think he said nation instead of union? Now, is that text dependent? That's context dependent. So within a history class, that's very pertinent. You're studying this period of time. You're talking about the Civil War. You're actually having conversation. And so now you're applying your content knowledge to answering that question. Is that a good question to exist within an English class? No. Not really. I mean, it, it, it's interesting. One of the exemplars that uh, David Coleman, who is the author, one of the authors of the standards and my boss, um, often uses is um, Martin, Luther's King, Martin Luther King's Letters from a Birmingham Jail. It's very difficult for people in large settings to read that without thinking about the lesson of the times of civil dis disobedience and the whole civil rights movement and say, no, we're just doing reading here. We're not talking about very difficult uh, to get people to do that. But with what we just did, focusing on the words, focusing on the meaning, the choice of words, the patterns of the sentences, the flow of the three paragraphs, we're just talking about literacy. We're just talking about literature, speech, writing, and all that. We're not talking about history. That's just close analytic reading. And that does get students stronger at other things. But you see quite a contrast here when you're reading uh, the rest of the sentences that are uh, within this module right here. Now, let's, t let's remind ourselves of the, the shifts in literacy. Anybody remember what the first shift is? Building knowledge using nonfiction. Does anybody want to kind of raise their hand and offer out how this might address that shift? Building knowledge using nonfiction. Well, first of all, it is nonfiction, right? So that's an obvious. Building knowledge, I'm not so sure that I would say that this builds any knowledge. Not the way we talked about it. Building knowledge within a social studies classroom? Absolutely. There really isn't so much of the content knowledge in here that you would expect to include in uh, an English class, but in a social studies class, you certainly could use this as a way uh, to build content knowledge. The second one, anybody want to venture a, a phrase for the second one? Second shift? Evidence from the text. That's all over this thing, isn't it? How do you know what proposition means? How do you know what dedicate means? What are we talking about? Know, why did we use this phrase instead of that phrase? All pouring in, pouring over these uh, phrases. It is absolutely evidence-based understanding. And when students understand this, and as you see, if you uh, want to take the time to look through the module, it has culminating tasks. Students are always translating, revising their translation to demonstrate their understanding of the text. And then the third one is what? The third uh, English language arts literacy shift. Complexity. This is complex. So now the question becomes, OK, great, Sandra. You gave us all these, this module. We could have every high school student in the state of Colorado do this module. What else do we do with this? What, what else does this help us understand the Common Core, Colorado Academic Standards, understanding this. And it's just this idea, does, is this a separate template? Is this something else to do? It's just an idea of when people are struggling with, A, what does close reading look like in a high school classroom? Can high school English teachers teach kids how to read? Can high school social studies teachers teach kids how to read? This is a model of what that might look like. This is also a model in what it means to have patience, to take time, to raise expectations for kids. This is a model uh, that I would say offers that as well um, to you. And it's also um, just to say, if you were to then kind of uh, tie this to, this exemplar I don't believe, let me just kind of look one more time, doesn't have something that a lot of our other exemplars um, have the citation, which standards are kind of hit on in this 
module. I know it's probably on every curriculum module template that ever existed, which standards are you hitting here? And just to say, when you do close analytic reading, standards on drawing evidence from the text and standards are complex of complexity are always there. And the standards in between in the Common Core in, in reading of you know, main ideas and all that, they all just kind of show up in relation to whatever text that you're doing. So I would ask you if you want to kind of further process this you know, additionally, that you would uh, kind of look at the standards and note that the mo what drives this is evidence and then the level of complexity. And finally, what you see at the end of this module, I might not have the whole one here, is that there is also a listing of vocabulary. And it's very important as you're thinking about how to do this in your own classrooms with your own texts to make some really strong choices about what information you give kids and what information you expect kids to learn how to pull from the text. Our goal here, just to reiterate, is that students can read complex text, demonstrate mastery of that reading by using evidence in response to that text with increasing independence. So this idea of a gradual release that you're not scaffolding this with kids. When they're sitting down in, assess in an assessment scenario where you're not probing them to say, look at this word, look at that word. But now that they have the ability to practice doing this, they actually get stronger at doing this. It takes time. It takes patience. That's why we think that having these exemplars helps teachers figure out my gosh, five days on the Gettysburg Address, what would that look like? I think without exemplars, there's a lot of people who couldn't imagine what that looks like. And so on the website that I showed you this morning, there is this exemplar, there's other um, high school exemplars, there's other middle school exemplars. I believe there's a couple of um, fourth grade exemplars on there as well. And Again, we take a lot of time on developing these. That's why we don't have hundreds of them. Um, but just to say, we're giving out these exemplars not only to teachers, not only to educators, but to publishers. And saying what we want is stuff that looks like this. So that when you go out and purchase materials, if you ever find money <laughs> in education, and we're actually start buying resources, that it looks like this. One great thing that I can share with you that, that is happening in the world is that New York State, uh, who we work very closely with, our offices are located in New York, um, they're one of the big Race to the Top winners. I think they got something like $700 million in their Race to the Top grant because they are so big. They are, uh, I think, the only race to the top winning state that decided that what they were going to do is have professionally developed curriculum modules available to their teachers, you know, voluntary, not mandated curriculum. And um, because it's federally funded, it is absolutely required that these modules are available for free to the world. And um, their contract where they uh, awarded their vendors had this Gettysburg Address module attached as an exemplar of what they want their vendors to develop. It is um, preschool through 12th grade. New York added preschool standards to the Common Core. Uh, preschool to 12th grade. And it is to cover 150% of a school year. And the reason for that is not unlike Colorado's model where they say, maybe I like this module, maybe I don't like this module, maybe I want to add my own thing in, to give teachers flexibility to kind of think of these modules as, I don't know, modular. Um, and, and so that you could kind of swap these things out. They are going to have the first of these modules available, um, the P5 for September. And this is about a year and a half thing that goes on. So just to say, because I have the ability as an outsider, like there is a lot of work going on out there. So as you're thinking about, you know, these curriculum modules for Colorado and, and for yourselves, I know, you know, listening in um, to Eagle County and, and Heather this morning about all the curriculum work that you guys have done, don't forget that these standards exist in 45 states in DC, the US Virgin Islands, and all those other places as well, they're common. 
So the fact that um, I feel like in education, we still are believing that when you use someone else's slides, someone else's curriculum, someone else's questions, tests, that that's cheating. It's copying. All of this stuff is open resource. Open, open meaning you don't have to say where you got it from. You just use it, own it. Um, it, it is meant for that. 100% meant for that. So I would encourage you to do that. I would encourage you to share with each other and, and think about that opportunity uh, that we have available for us. Um, I have a, a few moments left over, rare occasion. And one thing that I, I would like to say, I shared it with the group that I was talking with earlier today, and I shared it with a couple of folks last week. This is hard work that we're all doing here. Like, let's not mistake that. I would also add that this is hard work worth doing. It's not just hard because it's hard, and we're not just doing it because it's the year 2012 and someone decided we should do this. We're actually thinking here, believing here, and don't laugh, that we can change the world. I mean, imagine that. So I have two stories to share for, f with you about this. One is that um, we've been doing some work you know, with, with the U.S. Department of Education and, and some of the race to the top funded states. And they uh, consistently survey these states about, you know, what, what support do they need to get these race to the top initiatives implemented. And um, two things that they ask them is what is most urgent? What needs to happen like right now? And then also, what is going to have the greatest impact? So it might not be like immediate, but boy, if you don't attend to this thing, you won't be successful in this initiative. And as they were sharing the story with me, they told me that what was rated as the very bottom of the list was instructional leadership. And I'm ready to like change careers. I was like, what? Are you kidding me? And then they started getting deeper into the standards, hearing about these shifts, seeing exemplars like the Gettysburg Address and others, and now people are getting it. This work is not an alignment study. It's not a before and after shuffle topics around. Because if that's what it was, you're right. This doesn't take instructional leadership. And once these participants who had been surveyed for a good 14, 16 months rated instructional leadership as the bottom, once they got this message, just like a switch, now instructional leadership is the number one thing that they are demanding that is needed. But I'm, I'm gonna kind of add to this, because I don't think instructional leadership happens just in the offices without kids. Instructional leadership happens colleague to colleague, sharing your best practices, crying on each other's shoulders, celebrating your successes. I love the celebration say, I think that's so important. Hard work needs those things, needs all of those things, because what we can't have here is just, you know, these issues uh, of compliance. We really, you know, can't afford to miss this opportunity to literally, you know, change the world. So the other uh, story that I'll share is when I was a middle school principal, I had a teacher uh, who taught English language arts, and we didn't have air conditioning in the school in New Jersey. And uh, without fail, starting in May, we go to school till the end of June, pretty much in New Jersey, and starting in May, her students regularly showed up in my office. I mean, I just knew once it got hot out, Mrs. Miller's kids were coming to my office. And for whatever stroke of luck, genius maybe, whatever, she asked me to go to this workshop. And you know, teachers, at least in New Jersey, the practice is like, you wanna go to a workshop in May or June? Like, no, but I let her go. And she came back and said, it was like magic. You have to come to my class and observe what I learned at this workshop. And when a teacher asks you to do that, I mean, you don't, I mean, you run to that classroom, you go to see that. And she was teaching poetry to this, you know, hot, sweaty, hormone-raging group of eighth graders. And, um, you know, it was, would engage them. And uh, so she went over whatever structure of poetry it was that they were learning. And she said to the class, what I want you to do now is come up with three ideas for a poem that you would like to write. And you can picture the kids, oh, no, I don't want to do that. And raise their hand and say, oh, I can't do that. I can only come up with one idea. 
And she would go up to each of these kids very calmly, you know, one-on-one -on -one kind of thing, and say, but if you could come up with two other ideas, what would those other two ideas be? <laughs> and it was like magic. Oh, it would be this and this. And oh, I mean, I saw this, like, witness 100% that this happened. And why I think this conversation is so pertinent to this work is because it's so easy for us to say, all kids, huh, the common core, Colorado academic standards, new assessments, teacher effectiveness, all at once. But if you could do it, what would it look like? Keep an idea of that picture, what it would look like, and you have great people that you're working with, people in here, people in Denver, and so on. You know, you have the right place, the right time, if not now, when, all those great cliches, but this is the work to, to happen. I mean, the con stars have never been so well aligned, other than no money and no time, but other than that, like, this is quite an opportunity here, and I would just encourage you, those of you who are at the teaching side of these things, like really elevate these expectations. This Gettysburg Address, I mean, we did this with inner city kids in New York who nobody ever even thought they should see this kind of a text. Oh, they can't relate to it. Oh, it's too complex. They wrote emails to us about how much they enjoyed the opportunity to make sense of something like this. So just keep on imagining that. And I do believe we can change the world here. And, and I congratulate you. If I had my own award, I would give it to all of you. And, and thank you very much for this uh, time. I really appreciate it.